published in the IEEE Computer Design Magazine. And, and so I wrote a paper, and they accepted it. And it's like going my second year out of school. But then they sent me a letter and said, obviously this is a military project, but we need approval first. So I went to my company and they wouldn't approve it. I asked them if they would write the Navy, and they did, and they wouldn't approve it. And they wouldn't let me talk about it. I asked them if we can patent it. That was, they wouldn't talk about that, because all patents were public back then. Today they have private patents. So under today's laws, we could have done it. So basically, I, I couldn't talk about it. And uh, I would call the Navy, uh, the F-14 Comcat office about twice a decade, <laughs> send the paper, ask them if I could publish and talk about the paper. They just kept saying no, and finally in 1998, 30 years later, I had to go through my local congresswoman in uh, Northern California, and she wrote a letter, and finally they said, okay, uh, we'll let you talk about it. So this was introduced just about 10 years ago. And there's a computer festival in Northern California called Vintage Computer Festival. That they just, all the old designers, all the old machines, they bring together. It's really a lot of fun. And so the gentleman that runs that uh, said he would introduce uh, this project at the festival, which we did. Uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote an article on it. And since then, in fact, just two years ago, Smithsonian Museum Magazine called me and the lady left a message. I thought she was wanting me to subscribe to their magazine, like a telemarketing call. But, but she sounded a little different. So I called her back and she said, well, we're writing an article and we've, um, we've determined this design was one of the 10, see how put it, one of the 10 most innovative aerospace designs in the 20th century. And she wanted to write an article on it. So that was really quite an honor. And it came out a couple of years ago. So what am I doing now? Right now I'm, I'm living in Mississippi for two years, or this is my second year. I've decided to use whatever skills and talents and knowledge I have to help rural kids. Mississippi is the 50th in education. That's at the bottom. The county I'm in and the high school I'm working through is the second worst high school in Mississippi. 250 out of 250. Now, it's not that the kids aren't smart, they're just not being taught. That's really what it boils down to. And they have no motivation, most of them don't know what engineering is, they certainly don't know what the disciplines of engineering are. So I've been, uh, my main program right now is robotics. Uh, we have 37 students, middle school and high school, teaching them Lego robots, how to build them, all the math that goes with it, and the programming. Uh, I mean, I can see some really great engineers coming out of this. And web page design, I did an introduction to logic design with one group. So that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, and I've also been able to, uh, mainly because of, of me being able to talk at universities. I've talked at the four major universities in Mississippi. And of course they ask me, what are you doing here? You know, why aren't you in California? Why did you move here? And so I get a chance to tell them what I'm doing in Mississippi with the rural education. So I've been able to start a consortium, and this is the first time in history, because Mississippi people don't talk to each other too much, uh, especially academic people with rural people. So I've been able to put together, after two years now, a consortium of 28 people, and we're still growing. These are academic professors that are interested in education and engineering, and people who run rural schools, in you know, order from 20 students to 100 students. And we're sitting down, we're talking. You know, how can we help each other? How can we get the statistics? What kind of programs do you want? And out of this, we've been able to have the University of Mississippi uh, sponsor a rural math camp last summer. Uh, NASA has just sent a representative fully paid to come once a week and teach what they call creative math. And uh, so it's going pretty exciting. There's a 30% dropout rate with the students from high school. So that's our first challenge. The second challenge is to uh, get them into college and then get them graduated. So I would highly recommend sometime in your life, you know, just break away from, quote, the big money area and just, you know, do something like this because it's really quite rewarding. And 
it brings back all the basics of what you learn at the point. Okay, so I left Los Angeles, I went up to the University of Idaho. I had to pick a major, I picked forestry. Actually, I loved it. I was a junior in forestry, ready to graduate the next year. I'd work one summer in the Quarter Lake National Forest. I was a recreation manager in the Gulf of Ranger Ray. And I, nothing about engineering. And uh, the professor, the dean of engineering, called me in. I think it was the middle of my junior year. And he said, Ray, if you want to stay in engineering, I mean in forestry, you have to do better in chemistry. I was really struggling in chemistry. I never had a high school, and I had to take it for forestry. And then he just randomly said, why don't you take this class? And he pointed me to a class in physics of electricity. Nothing to do with forestry. And I think he saw maybe I was somewhat interested in math. So I took the class. <coughs> First time in my life. Straight A's on everything. Homework, exams, quizzes, final. And I found a friend in the class that was motivated like I was. So we would study this class in calculus four, and we both got straight A's in both of them. I actually made the dean's list for the first time in my life. My mother got a letter back here in LA, called me and said, Ray, I think there's been a mistake. I got this letter, you're on the dean's list. I mean, she had like little hope I would graduate. <laughs> well, I got so motivated, I just started looking at other schools. Where can I go for engineering? I applied to Cal Poly, it was a little closer to home. I was ready to come back after three years. And they accepted me. And um, so that's what started my Cal Poly career. I had to start over, basically. My freshman year was transferable, fortunately. No more history and all this other stuff, which I didn't care for. Uh, I was in the Army ROTC, a special ranger training unit. Uh, Kind of like that too, but when it came down here, you know, all that kind of went away. Then I got here at uh, Cal Poly Pomona. By the way, this picture is the first year where they laid the cement out there in the middle. Now, I don't know if you know the story. Uh, no, the first year of the cement, but the second year of the quad area. The first year they left it all grass. And they told us, just walk anywhere. Just everywhere, just walk anywhere, don't worry about the grass. And so after one year, there was uh, paths everywhere. And that's where they laid the cement. Terrific architectural plot idea. Uh, so if you don't like where this cement is, I'm one and one. So in 68, I graduated. But my junior year at Cal Poly, I had electives to choose. And one of the courses I chose was Introduction to Switching Systems, or Switching Theory. I didn't really know what it was, but on paper it sounded good. It was kind of math and engineering. Well, today it's probably called Introduction to Logic Design. And it was perfect. I just loved it. I loved the idea that, you know, if everything works, there's an answer that works. And if not, you can work back and find it. So it really stuck with me. And then I uh, went ahead and graduated the next year. I, I interviewed three companies. The one I chose was uh, Garrett uh, Air Research in uh, Torrance. And they were hiring me to design amplifiers on commercial aircraft. I didn't really like amplifier design here, but it was a good job. And it was a good offer, 17000 at the time. A fairly high paying job for a new engineer. And so I reluctantly took it. I really reluctantly went my first day. And uh, when I walked in, the human resource manager said, Ray, come on into my office. He sat me down, he opened my folder up, and he said, I see you've taken a class in computer design. And honestly, it was kind of through me, I didn't know I had. And I pointed to it, and it was this introduction to the switching theory class. He said, we have a special project for you, because you're the only one in our engineering department that's had a formal computer class. That's pretty scary. <laughs> you have one class, and they think it's great. And these are serious engineers. <laughs> so they, so we walked up. He actually took me down to the basement of the building, and he opened this. Uh, it was a big box, kind of like this. It actually looked like an oversized transmission. And he asked me if I knew what it was, and I had no idea. I told him I looked like a transmission. 
He said, no, that's the mechanical flight computer on the F-4 Phantom Jet, which was the main fighter in Vietnam at the time. He said, your job will be to convert that to a completely electronic computer. Now, that was really scary because back in high school, I found out the reason they said I shouldn't go into engineering is because my mechanical aptitude was low. And at the time, mechanical engineering was the big engineering skill. So here I am, having to, I thought, learn mechanical stuff and then convert it to electronics. So it was uh, honestly quite scary going in. Uh, this is a picture of me in the year we finished the project. I know it doesn't quite look like me. That's all right. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to work your way back real quick because some of you probably have no idea what happened in the 70s or 80s and you probably only read about in history. So just real quick, you know, the last 10 years, this is kind of what we've been exposed to in terms of uh, technology, computer technology. Uh, in the 90s, the Pentium was introduced. You know, we're from 100 megahertz to what, 3 gigahertz an hour higher. Uh, believe it or not, the 486, 386s. Does anyone here work with 386s? One, two, okay, that's probably your first one, right? Yeah. Well, there was life before this, believe it or not. In the 80s, we had 286s, which is basically the IBM PC. Now, most people think when IBM introduced the PC, that's when the computer world started. And that's not true. That was 10 to 12 years after the computer. The small computer world started. But it was a big deal. It was a big deal because it set a standard. And before that, there was no standards. Everybody had their own memory interface and their own CPU types and their own programming languages. But the PC forced a standard because of the volume, the potential volume that everyone thought it had. Then we get back in the 70s. This was the fun, fun, fun decade of computer design because anything you can think of in design is sold. I didn't sell big, but you saw 100 here and 500 here and 1,000 here. So it was really fun, and I feel very fortunate to, to have been an engineer during this time. And I'm going to show you some of the products that my company worked on. Uh, from 74 to 78, I had a company called Microcomputer Associates. We were like the first board level computer company. We actually started. So we came out with a new enhanced version of it for 249, and that was called the Jolt, and we called this the Super Jolt. And uh, basically, this everything that was in the Apple when they introduced it is on this board. Same 6502 Motorola microprocessor or Center Tech at the time. Uh, Microsoft Basic was just introduced on EEPROM. And so we would plug that in. And so when the board starts up, it started over at the basic, and then they can run their application. Um, today, at least as of a couple years ago, this board was still in production. Um, the technician I worked for ended up buying the rights to it from the company, and he started a new company called Sim Systems. And he reprogrammed it to uh, do special tests for hard of hearing made his own little box, and as of a couple years ago, he's still shipping it. So that's quite amazing. Then we started getting a lot of demand from engineering colleges, engineering labs. They, they, want, they want a board to teach the engineers how to program. This is around 76, 77. You know, the, the interest was there, the economics made sense to build a microprocessor into your design and then just reprogram it from then on. So we came up with this board, and we call it the first complete computer on a card. We have a touchpad, a keyboard, all already uh, labeled for assembly language. We have a display, we have a speaker, the microprocessor, the RAM memory, the I.O. chips, and then we have buffered I.O. So that you can tie it into motors and switches and stuff. So the, a lot of companies just took this card and just embedded it into their machine. But most of them were sold into engineering labs. And when I spoke in 99 or 2000, a professor came up and said, we're still using it. 
which is amazing. <laughs> amazing it's still working. But this this particular one, we sold 50,000 of these. Uh, this one is the 25th thousands. It was made special just for me as a designer, and then they had a gold plate. So I figured just the gold today is probably worth a lot. <laughs> it was at least an ounce on there. So that was in the 70s. You know, Radio Shack came out with their computer, Apple, uh, Intel was doing their second microprocessor, the 8080. And in 72, they did the 4004, which they claim is the first microprocessor. In fact, the way they say it, they used to say the first microprocessor, but since my introduction, they call it the first commercial microprocessor. And they call it the single chip microprocessor, but if you ever go back and look at the 4004, it takes 59 other circuits around it to work, even though the chip itself is single chip. So they're still being a little bit deceiving in my, my opinion. So what I worked on started in 68. Just, this is kind of what was happening at the time. Uh, the big deal was the floppy diskette, the big diskette. Does anyone know how many, how many bytes you can hold on that floppy diskette? Just yell it out, thank you. Huh? Two kilobytes? A little bit more. <laughs> the 100, 160 kilobytes. <laughs> but in most cases, for an assembly language program, that was a whole program. So it was a big deal, because before that, we had paper tape from a teletype machine. That's the only language story program. Maybe audio cassette, but that was very unreliable. You would constantly lose your programs. Bill Gates was 13. I've been throwing that in the last few years because people always ask me, what did Bill Gates have to do with the F-14 and all this stuff? Nothing. He was 13, and yeah, he probably was playing with some computer stuff, but he didn't have anything to do with it. So this was the challenge that I faced to make an integrated circuit computer, or what they called it was a solid state electronic computer, because they didn't really know the word integrated circuit at the time from a mechanical computer. And this is a close-up of the mechanical computer that I looked at. Honestly, it was very beautiful. Thanks. Gears and cams and potentiometers, chrome and gold. And it was really quite a, quite a nice looking piece of equipment. And uh, I didn't quite know where to start. And I, I learned quickly once I kind of integrated into the department Everything starts with math. The mathematics in this computer is the exact same mathematics in the one I did. You just implemented the math differently. And as you'll see later, it was all polynomials. So for those of you who hate polynomials, you better learn them. Because every, everything physically in the world can be represented by polynomials. So we, uh, the job was to build the flight computer for the F-14 Tomcat. It had three computers on board. It had the central computer, which is this one, called the central air data computer. It had the navigation computer and the communications computer. And uh, my computer fed information to the others. Uh, so we were the main data collecting computer. The very last F-14 that came out had, uh, I was told, like 26 computers. So every, every, every design on it was computerized to this day. So I worked for Garrett Air Research. Our contract was with Grumman Aircraft, and of course their contract was from the U.S. Navy. And then the company that we ended up using for the, the chips was American Microsystems. They were in Santa Clara. Actually, they're still around doing something in Idaho, but uh, their main their main office closed down after about 10 years. After I left Garrett, I was hired on by American Microsystems. And I was part of their first microprocessor design group. And we had 25 in our design group. We had designed two microprocessors, and one called the 7200, one the 7300, because of the 1972-73. Then they had a big meeting. Without us, the executives and the marketing people had a meeting. And they decided there was no future in microprocessors. And they wanted to stick with custom calculator chip design. And they fired all of us. And that's when I started my company to make these boards. Amazing decision. Amazing decision. 
The marketing guy was 25 years old, the executives were in their late 30s. But Intel had already come out with the 8080, and I guess they thought they just couldn't ever catch up with them. Which, you know, they could have, I think, because we already had too many. The team I worked with at Garrett, as you know, no engineering project is a, is a solo person. There's a great team I worked with. Uh, there was two of us on the logic design, I'm going to tell you about the other person in a minute. You know, we had programmers, uh, analog designers. The box itself was more than the computer. It had sensors to, to detect yeah. pressure yeah. sensor of the airplane. We had analog to digital converters so we could convert the pressure sensor to digital. And then we had to go digital to analog because the F-14 was the first aircraft with movable wings. And this computer actually moved the wings during flight. Now, I should rephrase that. It wasn't the first with movable wings. The first one with movable wings by computer. They call it fly-by-wire. The F-111 had movable wings, but it was mechanical or hydraulic from the pilot. So he had to be moving it while he was flying. The F-14, it was completely controlled by, by this computer. The other gentleman I worked with, uh, I was one of the two logic designers. His name was Steve Geller. He was, I was about 24, he was about 44. He had designed some big, big room kind of computers. His design concept was draw big blocks and connect them and give me the drawing to make it work. He said, well, come on down to the lab and I'll show you what I'm doing. No, no, no. He, he, anything over five volts, he didn't want to touch. It took a whole year before I got him down to the lab when the whole computer was working. And he was just amazed. And this is an example of engineers with theoretical training. Well, I just dug right in. You know, order the circuits, wire wrap the boards, get the power supply, you know, just, just make it work, check the rise and fall times on the circuits. And, uh, but he was pretty amazing. After a while, he just, he just kept drawing blocks. And he said, just whatever, whatever's inside, just do it. <laughs> and believe me, the whole computer ended up being like six blocks. And uh, I had to come up with uh, all the logic to, to make it work. So what did we do? We, we took a, uh, we had to develop a central air data computer. We started in June of 68 and we finished in June of 70. It was a two year project, about 12 hours a day, every day. The airplane flew for the first time December 21, 1970. Now, early on when I started talking about this, I was challenged a lot, like, this can't be real. It probably never worked. You know, the economy's like that. But the airplane flew two years before Intel announced their first microprocessor. We used the exact same technology that Intel used for 10 years. It's called P-Channel MOS. Um, all our stuff, of course, was commercial design. This is a military spec. So you know when you do military work, the specs are tighter, the temperature range is different, uh, the widths, the line widths on the integrated circuits are, are further apart. So it was quite a challenge. Uh, this is the airplane on the first day it took off. This was the final box. Now the PC cards are the A to D converters, D to D converters, and uh, computers. About halfway through the project, the military uh, sent a request for, uh, they said, please give us the see what they MTBA of the computer. Now, MTBA means mean time between failure. It's a popular military term. Basically, it says, tell us how reliable your design is. So my business managers come to me and they said, Ray, tell us all this. I said, this is brand new technology. <laughs> There's like one year history on designing chips. Of course, they, they freaked out. And they had to tell the Navy, and the Navy freaked out. He's like, what are you doing designing with technology? You have to have 10 year history on everything and double source, dual source, everything. I mean, we didn't even have a supplier yet. So they came back eventually and told us uh, we had to make everything dual redundant and we had to uh, completely self test the chips. They required 100% self test of all the chips. And I'll tell you how we did that in a second. So this is why everything is dual in the box. 
So when one computer goes out, it automatically switches to the second computer. Uh, this, this is something I found out way, well, when I first started talking. I didn't know any of this when, during the project. But what's really important from an engineer point of view is that the very last number, $5,000 for every day late. Because as a young engineer, I'd go to my supervisors, I'd say, uh, the schedule's too tight. We, we can't have it done by next week or so. Is it too bad? It has to be done. Do you want more money? Do you want more people? Do you want more equipment? That's no problem. <coughs> Every time for the whole two years. More money, more people, equipment, I could have it. But you have to be on schedule. And I'm sure this is why. So eventually the air and so we had a hundred high-tech aircraft sitting in Iran with a militant government at the time. So you can't imagine how tight and secret everything became. And that's one of the reasons I couldn't talk about it so long. Because we were trying to prevent those hundred aircraft from flying. We wanted to keep them on the ground. And even after the F-14 retired in 2006, uh, I don't know if you remember, but somebody was trying to sell the complete parts from an F-14 to Iran, and it got caught. Then the Pentagon decided to shred every F-14 that's left. So right now in Arizona, they're just slowly shredding all these planes. The titanium, you know, shredding titanium. Well, I got a, a little bit nervous because I had a website. I saw a website with a lot of details on it. So I called the F-14 office, and I just told them about it. And they said, well, we'll look at it coming back. They called me back in about a week, and they actually asked me to take stuff off the website. It was like 40 years after the design, because they were still concerned about the planes in Iran. I understand Iran has been able to get 30 of them in the air, but there's still 70 of them with the very first designs sitting on the ground right now. The computer itself, I was given 40 square inches for the computer. So just one small circuit board, 10 watts of power, and the cost was around two or three thousand. Like I said earlier, mil spec. So it was quite a challenge uh, because you just couldn't take these math equations and say, okay, we're going to make it like this. We researched all the technologies: CMOS, uh, TTL, and nothing would fit into these requirements. And so we were forced to go to this new concept of LSI, large-scale integration, more than four gates in a package. Uh, we ended up with like 3,000 in one on chip. So we really, really, really were pushing the technology. And what I want to do now is show you a three-minute, um, I know some of you have class, and I'm not insulted to take a real class, it's okay, because I believe this is going to be on the website. I want to show you a three minute video of the aircraft in flight. And for a couple of reasons. One is you'll see the wings move, and it's completely controlled by the computer. And also, you'll see a lot of uh, cloud formations around the plane. And that happens when the plane is going through the speed of sound. You'll see the cloud come out, and the plane actually becomes unstable a little bit. And so the computer had to constantly adjust for the stability of the plane as it goes through there. So
you saw the movie Top Gun, that, that song Danger Zone was the next song. And the Danger Zone is when they went through Mach 1. That's where the planes blow apart, shake apart. And that was a huge challenge. And a lot of the changes during the development phase was because of that Mach 1 uh, moment. Because the surfaces of the plane was affected, the uh, vibration and everything. There was a lot of mechanical design changes uh, on the plane because of that. So this computer, we had to calculate altitude, airspeed, vertical speed, Mach number, all the information that the pilot needs to run the plane, and all the information the other systems need to, uh, to do what they need to do. And one of the big systems we sent data to was the, the weapon system. And the F-14, it could actually shoot seven training missiles at the same time. So we had to make sure that it was getting data fast enough for all those missiles to fly accurately. Uh, then we had to move, move the wings. This was a whole new design concept. Uh, we've studied harmonics, mechanical harmonics, uh, hydraulic harmonics, electrical harmonics. Harmonics is a big deal. If you're moving a big wing like that, if you move it too fast, the harmonics gets back into the whole plane and shakes it. So even after we had the computer program, there was a request came back from the Navy and they said, please, when you send data to the DDA converters, which thus drives the motors and the hydraulics to drive the wings, would you do it at the exact same moment in the timing cycle every time? Because they didn't, they didn't want us to kind of have a variable command going to the wing. Well, it turned out the design we had was a fixed Time design. So we just told them we are already done that. And they were very happy because they could lower the weight of the wing because of that. Um, so these are the technologies I went through TTL and MOS logic modules. Uh, none of them could even come close to what was needed. This is the block diagram of the entire box that I showed you earlier. The computer. You know, it's in the one box called computer memory. But we had uh, uh, pressure sensors, which were high technology at the time. Uh, A to D and D day converters that were 20-bit converters. 16-bit was technology at the time. So our, our circuit designers who did that uh, was pushing the envelope. So we had to do basic, basic uh, functions that all computers do today. Uh, including the self-test, which I'll tell you in a minute, it's right here, in fact. Um, I said earlier, the Navy told us, okay, this is brand new technology, it's unacceptable, basically, but uh, we convinced them this is the only way to do it. So they said, we want you to 100% test every chip while the plane's flying. And then if there's a problem, switch over to the second computer. And I had already had the whole thing programmed. And you'll see in a second how we programmed it, but basically what we decided to do, and I worked with the mathematician, we just developed test patterns. Different patterns for divide and multiply and add and subtract and logic functions that would test every, every wire and every transistor on the chips. Now, my brother, who had just graduated from Stanford, he was hired by the same company. They put him on the project to work with me. So him and I worked together on this diagnostic. He wrote a Fortran simulator to simulate every chip, every transistor, every wire, wire by wire, so that we can run the test patterns through and we can simulate failures and make sure it all worked. And the program was so large and so long that on our final run, it was going to take like two days and the payroll of the company was due and they had to go to the president of the company, and he said, stop payroll. This is important. Well, that's, that's how important this project was. These are the equations that we had to use, or this, that, that I worked with, the mathematician, he was the brilliant one. He was an applied mathematician. Wow, what a hands-on guy. He could touch anything and tell you the formulas for it. And every time 
he had problems, he was just like, think, 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 and said, okay, change the constant on the third order. Okay, it was just amazing. <laughs> but these are the equations. Of course, the top way, the top method is the normal way you write it, and the bottom method, which is a nested, that's the way we actually implemented it in the programming. Uh, it was a fractional fixed point computer, two's complement arithmetic, 20 bit in length. This is not a 4 bit computer, an 8 bit computer, it's a 20 bit computer. Um, some of this I already mentioned. The final architecture, we went through a lot of architectures, and of course we went through one where everything was parallel, parallel transfer of all the data between chips, but the packet. Uh, these are the computational requirements. Uh, the left-hand column is what was required, and the right-hand column is, is the maximum the chips could have done. Of course, they asked us you know, to leave some room for, uh, for changes later on. So you see, we, we actually only used about half of the capability of the chipset in the first release of the plane. Now this is per second, so 5,000 multiplies per second, and divide that by 18, and that's how many we have to do every 18 of a second. This is all real time, while the plane's flying, while it's shooting missiles, while it's moving wings. Okay, I'm going to kind of skip through these next few, but I'll just give you an idea. These are the six different chip types. Uh, this was the parallel multiplier. So I was the logic designer, so after designing the logic on big sheets of paper, then I went, flew up to San Jose or Santa Clara, I worked with American Microsystems with their designers. We had to decide how we're going to lay this out on the chip. And of course they went through two or three different layouts. Then they had to get their manufacturing to decide, you know, can we make these chips? They're twice as big as we've ever made chips. But if you'll notice, uh, and I'm sure some of you who have done uh, binary adder designs, uh, this is a 20 bit multiplier, so you'll see 20 similar modules on the chip. Each one of those is an adder. And I spent about two months doing the design of that adder along with the, the chip designers out of micro microsystems trying to get it as small as possible because we knew whatever it ended up, we just repeated 20 times to keep the chip as small as possible. Then we had a 20-bit divider, and here we decided to put, and the divider is just a series of subtractions. So this was an adder turned into a subtractor, and we had two of them together, so there should be like nine different similar modules around the chip. And this was the, the main uh, chip for the add, subtract, and logical functions. The, we call it the steering logic unit, but it was a digital multiplexer. It's the one that, that took data from the multiplexer into the memory, or from the multiplier into the memory, then we bring it out later and divide and send it back to the memory and bring it out and multiply. We're performing all these math functions on the plane's line. Uh, this is the, the RAM. We call it random access storage. Today we call it random access memory. It's, 20, it's 16 20 bit uh, RAM locations. And this is the read only memory, the largest chip made at the time. I think this has about 3,200 transistors on it. This is the summary of all the chips. And you'll see at the bottom there's 74,442 active devices, transistors on all the chips that made up the first, air, uh, first flight. Now the 62,092, that's pretty important. Though that's the program. That's the binary bits in the program. We had no assembler, we had no simulators. That was all programmed by hand, by me. That's where my Calpol experience really came in. That hands-on, binary multiplexers, how binary controls A to Ds and D to As. Honestly, it was just a fun lab. <laughs> it took about three months to program it by hand. But it, I just had a great time, honestly. Just figuring all these ones and zeros to control all, this, all these chips. 
It took three months to get a wrong made back then. So once we committed to the chips, we had to wait three months to see if it was going to work. And so the day came when they gave us the, the, actually they gave us three sets of chips to start with. The first chip, the first set, the Navy popped the lids and took pictures of the inside. That's how I got these pictures. And, and I kept the chips. So this, afterwards you can come and look at it. This is the first set of chips off of the production line. The second chip we plugged into a simulator, and the whole first day, everything was perfect. Everything worked, it was amazing. And the second day, in the morning, everything worked. Around noon time, there was a glitch. There's flaps on the airplane to stabilize it, and one of the flaps just kind of flipped open for some reason. And I went to the mathematician, I told him all this, and he just like closed his eyes. He says, okay, I know. He told me what to change, and it worked. And so I took that data change and I figured out the ones and zeros. I said, because at that time, you can actually etch off a zero, but you couldn't etch off a one because they had to manufacture a one. This is in the, the wrong memory. And it was the wrong way. In other words, they had to redo the wrong three month delay. And I had to go tell my boss this. My boss was a 100% business manager. He had no idea in the world what we were doing. He was just business with the, with the Navy. He yelled at me for about a half hour and told me we had plenty of time and we had all this equipment to make it work perfect and all this stuff. And, uh, but he went ahead and told the Navy and they decided that, well, that function is not working. We're not gonna test it for six months. So they went ahead and accepted the first chips. And they actually uh, proved everything worked perfectly of what they tested. But after about two weeks, I, I kind of, it was bothering me, I got chewed out for that. One bit been wrong. And uh, I went back to my boss and I, I asked him if I could talk to him. And he was a little nicer than since the Navy had already accepted the chipset. And uh, so I explained to him all this, we went through all the technology, all the design, all the chips. And he sat there like he was hearing something for the first time. He was so impressed, he gave me a 10% raise. <laughs> so that's a good nice. story. You know, make sure who you work for, they know what you're doing. Now in military, they, you have a technical manager and a business manager. He was the business manager. And, uh, but he's the one that controlled the paycheck. Uh, this is a copy of the chips, which are in the, the book here. Uh, instructions uh, of all the chips, each, each chip had its own instruction set, so we had 133 instructions. This is an example of uh, one of the equations. It's called the angle of attack. And that is when the plane's flying, it's, it's the angle in the three-dimensional atmosphere of the plane. And the reason they had to know that on this plane is because when they fired missiles, you always want to fire a missile perpendicular to the plane. You don't want to fire it into the airplane. So they had to constantly know the angle of the plane, so when they fired a missile, and you've probably seen pictures of these missiles like just going off everywhere. They're always perpendicular to the plane. And that was this equation right here that, that helped that. Uh, this, we did a lot of this, it's called scaling. And I'd never, I honestly, I'd never heard of it in this school. And it's the idea that you have a 20-bit number, but by the time you multiply it a whole bunch of times or divide it a bunch of times, you might end up with zero because the significant part is way off the 20-bit. So we, so we had to constantly be adjusting the number to keep the significant digits within the 20 bits that we're computing. And then we had limits on it. Um, like when you move the wings, there was a limit. You just couldn't keep moving them forward and backwards. They had to stop eventually. And so we were constantly scaling the numbers and limiting the numbers as we, as we did the mathematics and that's representative of this. 